service begins on page 351, page 351 of the Book of Common Prayer. Bless the Lord who forgives all our sins, his mercy endures forever. Jesus said the first commandment is this, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is the only Lord. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other greater commandment than these. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us that we may delight your will walk in your ways, to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life.
Holy God, holy and mighty, holy immortal one, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, whose blessed Son was led by the Spirit to be tempted by Satan, come quickly to help us who are served by many temptations. And as you know the weakness of de- in each of us, let us find you mighty to save through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, now one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for our reading. A reading from the book of Genesis, from the 17th chapter. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you, and your offspring after you throughout their generations, for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, As for your wife, Sarai, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The psalm appointed for today is Psalm 22, verses 22 through 30. We will read the psalm in unison, ending it with the refrain. Praise the Lord, you that fear him. Stand in awe of him, O offspring of Israel. All you of Jacob's line, give glory. For he does not despise you, nor abhor the poor in their poverty. Neither does he hide his face from them. But when they cry to him, he hears them. My praise is of him in great assembly. I will perform my vows in the presence of those who worship him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied, and those who seek the Lord shall praise him. May your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall bow down before him. For kingship belongs to the Lord, He rules over the nations. To him alone are all who sleep in the earth, how down in worship. All go down to the dust, fall before him. My soul shall live for him. My descendants shall serve him. They shall be known as the Lord's forever. They shall come and make known to a people yet unborn the saving deeds that he has done. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord. The second reading today is from Romans chapter 4. For the promise he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. 
If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null, and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham. For he is the father of all of us, as it is written, I have made you the father of many nations. In the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said, so numerous shall your descendants be. He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about a hundred years old, or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver, considering the promise of God. But he grew strong in his faith, as he gave glory to the God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. Now the words it was reckoned to him were written not for his sake alone, but for ours also. It will be reckoned to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel, our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus began to teach the disciples that the Son of Man must suffer many things, be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and three days rise again. And he said this plainly. And Peter took him and began to rebuke him. But turning and seeing his disciples, Jesus said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan, for you are not on the side of God, but on humans. And he called him and the multitude with his disciples and said to them, 
If anyone would come after me, let them deny themselves, take up their cross, follow me. For whoever would save their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit one to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? For what can we give in return for our life? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed. And when he comes in glory of his Father with the holy angels. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Let us pray. Holy God of all people, God of Abraham and Sarah, God of Paul, Peter, all the disciples, God of us, may your word dwell with us. Not my word, not our word, but your word, our Lord, plant it within us so we may always be seen as children of the living God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Please be seated. So Jesus makes it clear. The Messiah is the one who saves through weakness, not power. Who who redeems by suffering, not conquest. The one who gives his life as ransom, not the one who asks others to die for him in battle. Peter pulls aside Jesus and says, "We, we need to talk. And he goes on and tells his teacher and his master that he's dead wrong. That Jesus should never say the Messiah must suffer. And in an instant, Jesus quickly rebukes Peter and forcefully and tells Peter, get behind me, Satan. This story is really well known and probably a lot of us have heard sermons about Peter's rebuke and his rebuke of the Messiah's true mission and how the disciples, especially in Mark's gospel, always seem to misunderstand Jesus and his purpose. But that interpretation seems to me to look back into history. Although written ago many centuries, the gospel has the power to still enter our lives to this day, but we have to have the courage to allow it in, to hear the good news and not just go on with our day, but to allow the word of God to be planted in us like a seed and grow. So what would happen? (laughs) What would happen if we put ourselves in Peter's shoes. What would Jesus say to me, to you, to us? What would Jesus rebuke in us? Probably not our misunderstanding of Jesus' mission, the Bible, or even who God is. Jesus always seemed to be having the uncomfortable habit of getting real with us. He really doesn't seem to care how deep our faith is, but how we treat our neighbors, especially the neighbor we're quick to judge, the ones we ignore, the brother and sister we treat as inferior. We all love the gentle, accepting Jesus Until that is, he quickly turns on us, 
sends his fiery prophetic anger at us and says, get behind me. Like the money changers in the temple, all too often we sit at a table Jesus wants to flip. And we have to admit it. After witnessing in this past year the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and way too many other black men and women and even children, our culture sits at a divided table, at a table of racism. But of course, you and I are quick to say, I'm not racist. Until we look and see our country, really see it, where the infant, mortali- the infant mortality rate for blacks is twice as high as it is for whites. That the percentage of black children living below the poverty level is three times higher than those of white children. That from the 1930s to all the way to the 1960s and probably later, within sizable black populations, they were marked with red ink on a map. So banks would know not to where give loans. A practice known as redlining. The practice was supposed to be banned over 50 years ago, but in a study just done last year, showed that three out of four communities that were redlined are still dealing with heavy economic crises to this day. Schools in mainly white neighborhoods receive $2,200 per student more than non-white schools. The imprisonment rate of African Americans remains five times greater than white Americans. And black people are about 12% of our population, but one-third of the inmate population. So no matter how informed or anti-racist we may think we are, all of us who are white are living a life of privilege, myself included. I can be at a stoplight and the police car next to me, the officer won't look at me twice. I can wear a hoodie and jog through my neighborhood and not be seen as a threat. I can go to a park to go bird watching. Nobody's going to call the police on me. I can walk up to your door and you'll feel comfortable answering it. And I can do this without thinking about how I make others feel, about how to make them feel safe in my presence. As you remember, through these Sundays of Lent, we're going to be looking at black Episcopalians who made a big difference in our church. And today I want to talk about someone well-known to many of you, Absalom Jones, who in 1762 was sold as a slave as he watched his mother and his six siblings be sold to somewhere else. Understanding the value of education... Absalom, even though it was against the law at the time, somehow got a hold of a reading and writing primer, and with courage and determination that showed his whole life through, he learned how to read and write. Absalom married Mary King, another slave, and not long after their marriage, because he was working so many odd jobs, mostly for the Quakers, who actually paid him a little bit, he was able to buy her freedom. Originally a devout Methodist, Absalom was worshiping at St. George Methodist Church in Philadelphia, one of the few churches in that city that opened its doors to black worshipers. And through his care and his preaching, the church grew tenfold. As the number of St. George blacks members increased, their presence became no longer welcomed. One Sunday morning, a trustee of the church demanded that Absalom and the other black congregants move themselves out of the main sanctuary and go up to the gallery, which was known as the Slave Gallery. When Absalom refused to do this, 
The trustee actually attempted to, to forcefully remove him upstairs, and it was then that he and the entire company of black congregants literally walked out of St. George's, never to return. Jones and his many, many family members sought membership in the Episcopal Church in the Diocese of Pennsylvania. And so on October 17th, 1794, St. Thomas African Episcopal Church was, a first, was officially accepted as the first black Episcopal Church in the United States. And St. Thomas is still a very active parish in Philadelphia. And Absalom Jones became the first ordained priest of African descent in 1804. Oddly enough, Father Absalom also dealt with a pandemic. And it was during the yellow fever outbreak that Father Absalom's reputation as a pastoral presence, as a comforting presence, grew as he helped nurse the sick and the dying and helped to bury over 120 bodies every day. During his ministry, Father Absalom upheld a deep conviction that religion and social action go hand in hand. And he loved to quote Galatians 5.1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Peter was certainly yoked in seeing a Messiah, he wanted. The one Israel wanted. He couldn't understand that Jesus' greatest deed was not accomplished by power. It was accomplished by vulnerability. A strength demonstrated in weakness and born out of sacrificial love. How could Peter miss Jesus so much? Perhaps the better question probably a more uncomfortable one for me and you, is how could we miss Jesus? Are we, truthfully, any different from Peter? Don't we want a God to conform to our sense of what God should be? The kind of divine big brother who's always looking out for us, redeeming and saving us through power, restoring us to the fortunes we think we deserve. Don't we desperately want a God that we want? <laughs> a God that we need? And is this not the very definition of what it means to be like Satan, trying to control God? We even control God in deciding who belongs in our church and who doesn't. <laughs> As the Reverend Martin Luther King uh, most famously said, the most segregated place in America is 10 o'clock on Sunday morning. People of St. Gregory forced Father Absalom out of his church just because of his skin color. He didn't fit in with their understanding of God. Peter only saw the Messiah he wanted to see, a Messiah sent by God to overthrow the enemies of Israel, to reestablish the kingdom of David rooted in Abraham and Sarah. A Messiah that came to save Peter's people, not the world. And Jesus rebuked him for thinking that Jesus came for revenge and not redemption. Came for the hatred of Romans instead of healing. Peter couldn't accept that forgiveness would flow from the cross. Peter had a privileged view of God. God was for him, not for others. After rebuking Peter, Jesus turns to the crowd and says to us and to them, pick up your cross and follow me. Do you ever think how easy it could have been for the author of the cosmos to establish forgiveness some other way? 
all God had to do if God is really God was maybe just snap a finger and poof, forgiveness. Instead, as our prayer book says, God stretched out his arms on the hard wood of the cross. It seems to me that racism is that cross, and it seems to be in our country's DNA. But what can I do? What can you do? The problem seems too big for us, too heavy to carry. And it's true, I think, that our own history of picking up the cross and following Jesus is not exactly always on point. We're embroiled in sin and brokenness of our own making and the sin and brokenness of our heritage. But we shouldn't let that stop stop us from attempting to comfort racism and give in to the brokenness and the powers of death and evil. After all, that would deny everything Jesus is, everything Jesus did, and all that he calls us to be. We may never pick up our cross perfectly because we are inclined to see and want a God that we want. And we miss a God who's actually doing something and has done something. We are regularly surprised when God shows up in the cross, in moments of weakness and doubt, in moments of despair. Thank God that we were not given the Messiah we wanted, but the one we desperately needed. In her book, Big, Little Big Change, Dr. Tracy Fisher writes that the first and most important step to overcome, recon- overcome racism is recognition. Only recognition, she writes, will lead to transformation. We must understand that systemic racism is a fact and not get lost in guilt and shame. Transformation can only begin with with recognition. We must see our racism in our world, in our community, and in us. Jesus calls us to carry the cross and follow him, to lose our life for him and for the gospel, or perhaps a better way to say it, lose racism for Jesus' sake and for the sake of his gospel. The cross we must lift is the acknowledgement of our white privilege. Only then will things begin to change. Lift the cross of systemic racism and carry it. The steps we take on that path must be our own. We can, of course, devote ourselves to discovering uh, what our unconscious biases are. We can seek out to see what we hold in common with those we see as different from us. We can educate ourselves to see how racism began in our city, in our town, and in ourselves, as our bishop encourages us to do. We can donate to the NAACP, to Black Lives Matter, to the Urban League. But I think most importantly, we must do the necessary work to prevent racism and keep on preventing it again and again and again. That's what it is to walk carrying the cross. Last few weeks, I've been watching the Dr. Henry Louis Gates Jr., The Black Church on PBS, and it's been incredibly inspiring. Since its beginning, Dr. Gates points out, the African-American community and the church have a vital role together. And yet, to be honest, I also found the program devastating because it makes it quite clear that we were the ones who pushed out our black brothers and sisters out of our churches because of our hatred, our fears. They had established their own places of worship. More than any other major faith, Christianity has far more divisions. It seems to me that what we believe about God is more important than what God believes about us. 
that we want to define God, make God in our image, be like Satan trying to destroy God, trying to find God in all the wrong places. Put that behind you. Jesus' voice rings through the centuries. Pick up your cross. Let go of your life, Jesus says. Let go of your divisions. Let go of your hatred, your racism. Come, follow me. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Turning to page 358, page 358 in the Book of Common Prayer, let us proclaim our faith. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus the Christ, the only Son of God, God and the God from Father, God from God light from light, true God from true God, be not in all made for all great mercy, whose time all things are made, for us and for our salvation, and down from heaven, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, became incarnate from the Virgin Mary, for our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, suffered death, and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He descended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again, glory, judge, living and the dead. The kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and Son. With the Father and Son and his worship and glorify, and has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism, forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people are found on page 385 in the Book of Common Prayer. I ask your prayers for God's people throughout the world, for our Bishop Kathleen, for this gathering, and for all ministers and people. Pray for the church. I ask your prayers for peace, for goodwill among nations, and for the well-being of all people. Pray for justice and peace. I ask your prayers for the poor, the sick, the hungry, the oppressed, and those in prison. Pray for those in any need or trouble. I ask your prayers for all who seek God or a deeper knowledge of him. Pray that they may find and be found by him.
I ask your prayers for the departed. Pray for those who have died. I ask your prayers for healing for Ron, Deb, Melissa, and Jill. Praise God for those in every generation in, tomb, in whom Christ has been honored. Pray that we may have grace to glorify Christ in our every day. O oh Lord, our God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O oh lover of souls. And to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Peace of the Lord be always with you. Please share with one another a sign of God's peace. Peace be safe. Peace with you. Please have a seat. Well, good morning, church. Good morning. So glad to see all of you here with us and all those who may be watching on Facebook Live right now or later. All those watching are always welcome to put a prayer request in a comment section and we will join you in prayer. Those who are here in the church will quickly tell you who are watching that we have big blue tarps on our floor <laughs> because we have a leak in our ceiling. And uh, probably about a month before the leak in our ceiling, we had some major furnace repair. So we kind of got a one-two punch here at St. Aidan's, but we're doing fine. But I was just thinking this morning that we usually average about 150 to 175 people who watch our worship service online. So just think, if all of you right now went to the St. Aletha website, stalatha.org, went to the diocesan link, and donated $5 to St. Aidan's. Just think what that would do. Just putting that in your, in your mind to think about, especially during this season of Lent, it can certainly be an act of penitence, an act of thinking, giving thanks to God. We continue, of course, with our Wednesday afternoon, I should say Wednesday noonday prayer every Wednesday on Facebook Live. I'm happy to see that so many of you join me doing that. And on Thursday nights, we have hot cocoa with Father Tom. It's just a time for us to gather on Zoom to kind of share what went through our day and how we're doing. Although with the latest weather, I'm thinking of changing it to iced tea with Father Tom. So <laughs> think about that. <laughs> Thank goodness, because yesterday was a beautiful day. I hope all of you got outside to enjoy it. Are there other announcements that we need to make? Happy March, almost everyone. Let us walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
Eucharist per C begins on page 369 of the Book of Common Prayer, page 369. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. At your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space galaxies, suns, the planets in their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. From the primal elements you brought forth the human race, blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Again and again you called us to return. Through the prophets and sages you revealed your righteous law. And in the fullness of time you sent your son, Jesus, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open up us to the way of freedom and peace. And therefore we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus and with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those of every generation who have looked to you in glory and hope to proclaim their unending hymn. And so, Father, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by the power of your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, gave it to his friends and said, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine when he given thanks and said, Drink this, all of you. This is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving, celebrate his death and resurrection. Lord God of our fathers, God of Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Jacob, God of our ancestors, of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only, not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Accept these praises and prayers, Father, 
through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and give us our promises, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom power and the glory ever. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. For let us peace. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Grant us peace. And together with all those who watch our service, let us pray the prayer of spiritual communion. My Jesus, we believe you are truly present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. We desire to offer you praise and thanksgiving as we proclaim your resurrection. We love you above all things and long for you in our soul. Since we cannot receive you in the sacrament of your body and blood, come spiritually into our heart. Cleanse and strengthen us with your grace, Lord Jesus, and let us never be separated from you. May we live in you and you in us in this life and the life to come. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. All are welcome at this table. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven, Mark. In the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. In the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Clarice, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Barb, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Christ, the bread of heaven. There, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. And the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Janet, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Don, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Body of Christ, bread of heaven, Jill. All the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Carolyn, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Neil, the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Here in the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Thank you.
Turning to page 365, page 365 in our Book of Common Prayer. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with food in the body of his body and blood. Send us now to the world in peace. Grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Keep this your family, Lord, in your never failing mercy, that relying solely on your help of your heavenly grace, they may be upheld by divine protection through Christ our Lord. Thank you. 